Hi, my name is Don Patterson, and this is a lecture about XML file encoding. It's the third in a sequence of what I expect to be about five lectures looking at the format of XML. And we're going to do a little bit more work with character encoding um, today to talk a little bit about the way XML works with characters. So the key points are that files are bits that are stored on secondary storage devices. Bits are translated into text using character encodings. And incorrect tables or incorrect character encodings result in funky characters on your display. XML is stored in text files. And when you work with data, you're working with bits, but you're looking at it through several layers of abstractions. For example, the way Photoshop will show you an image, that image is stored as bits on your file system, but Photoshop shows you what it's supposed to represent. Different systems need to specify what encoding they use when they exchange data. For example, a web server telling a browser to use UTF-8 to encode its text. When in doubt, though, just use UTF-8. As we discuss XML, we're looking at the different layers of the um, language syntax. And this is going to cover our characters layer. Remember, an XML file is just plain text. There's nothing fancy about an XML file. A program that can read and write text, like Word, can read and write an XML file. But an XML-aware application is going to expect that your XML file has a very specific syntax. And it's going to interpret the tags that it sees in that XML file based on whatever its purpose is. Whatever kind of program you're running will know what to do with particular tags that it encounters. Here's the first line in an XML declaration. In an XML file, this is the first line that you will see. And it's important for establishing what the encoding is, for example. The first thing that we notice is that the declaration starts and ends with a funny set of characters. Uh, it is a less than and a question mark and then a question mark and a greater than. This forms a kind of meta tag. It's, it's only used in the declaration, an XML declaration. So you just kind of have to memorize that this is where, it, where it, what it gets used for. There are two different kinds of versions that you can declare your XML file is going to be following version 1.0 or version 1.1. And what you're doing is you're declaring how the, how the text that's going to follow below is going to be interpreted. If you were doing version 1.0, the declaration is optional and all of the defaults that you see specified here are assumed. But if you use version 1.1, the declaration is mandatory. You have to have it at the top of your file. And the reason why 1.0 moved to 1.1, among other things, is because there were some encoding ambiguities that got resolved between multiple different Unicode versions. All right, so the first thing that you see is you see in this, uh, you see the XML over on the left, and then you see an attribute called version, and it gets an equal sign because you're assigning it a value, and then you're giving it the string um, blocked off by double quotes, and the string is 1.1 saying that the version of this file is going to be XML version 1.1. The next thing that you see is you see a declaration with an attribute called encoding, an equal sign, and a string that says UTF-8, bounded by quotes as well, double quotes. This says that the bits that follow in this file should be interpreted as UTF-8 characters when, when, the document try, when the program that's reading it tries to understand the characters that are present. Straightforward. This is the, you know, the most widely used character encoding we've got. Finally is an attribute called standalone. Standalone is assigned the value yes in double quotes, so yes as a string. And what this means is it means that this document can be DTD validated without retrieving external documents. That has to do with the schema that we haven't talked about yet. Um, but um, yeah, so it is, it is a setting and uh, we'll talk about it when we get to schemas. We know about character encodings a little bit. A character encoding is a rule for, for interpreting bits as characters. So here's a sequence of bits. These bits are in the ASCII encoding format, a subset of UTF-8. And if you were to look up the translation, 
Each one of those these sets of eight bits translates to a letter. H-E-L-L-O space W-O-R-L-D. Hello world. There's a different uh, set of bits for a capital letter and a lower letter. And so this has a capital H and a capital W associated with it. Knowing that we're looking at these bits in ASCII encoding helps us to understand that we're looking at the phrase hello world here. ASCII always uses eight bits per character and can only represent 128 characters. And the reason why we didn't stay with ASCII is because it can't handle international characters. When you think about a character encoding, there are three things that you can break it down into. First of all, you can think about a character set. A character encoding has a character set, or the set of characters that a particular character encoding can represent. ASCII can't represent everything. For example, it can't represent an enye, or the Hispanic uh, character of an N with a tilde over the top of it. Doesn't have a doesn't have a representation for that. It doesn't have a representation for um, a, an uh, like an O with the dots over it. I think that's an umlaut. It doesn't have a representation for any of the kiragana or hiragana characters in the Japanese language. So we had to move on from ASCII. Its character set is missing those characters. What's a code page? Well, a code page tells us how to translate the bits into a particular character. It's the translation guide. It's the Rosetta Stone. And finally, a string. A string is just a sequence of characters that have been encoded in a particular character encoding. It is the set of characters that results from turning bits into characters using a particular encoding. Here's the ASCII character set, the set of characters that can be represented using the ASCII encoding. These are the subset of ASCII characters that are printable. There are a few characters that don't have a printable version of them. Um, space, for example, is one of them. But these are the ones that we can represent. You can see they're missing almost every international character you can imagine. Here's an example of the ASCII code table. And in this case, we take the decimal number on the left and we translate it to the ASCII character on the right. For example, the decimal number 85 translates to a capital letter U. So when we have um, bits that represent the number 85, we would interpret that as a U. Finally, here are a bunch of ASCII strings. We have hello world. This is the string we saw in the earlier in the slide deck that was translated into bits. What is the weather? This one's okay too because it's got a, characters we can represent including a question mark that's part of the ASCII code uh, set. Map of California, capitals and lower cases, space. I received a 10% discount. No problem, percent is one of the characters we can represent in ASCII. His phone number is 555-55512. ASCII also includes digits and dashes. Finally, we have please translate this, colon. Colon's okay, the rest of the characters are fine. Those are all valid ASCII strings, great. Here are some problems with ASCII though. These are strings that we can't represent. Donde esta? Where, where is it in Spanish? Upside down question marks? Nope. Letters with accents? Nope. Smorgasbord. Bunch of letters with uh, various kinds of international, uh, was it diacritics over it? Nope. Can't represent that. Uh, German word with um, characters that aren't part of the, Ameri uh, the English um, character set? Nope. Uh, mathematical notations like infinity plus infinity equals infinity? Nope. That's not part of it. Um, Egyptian hieroglyphics? Nope. Can't do that. Um, emoji, like pizza, ghost, 100, bike, surfer. Can't do that either. So all things that ASCII can't represent. On the one hand, it may not be critical that we're able to represent pizza image with ASCII. It does seem kind of important that we would be able to represent foreign languages with our character encoding. This was what motivated the development of UTF-8, UTF-16, and UTF-32. These are each character encodings that support international characters. For example, Chinese and Arabic, Thai, emoji, etc. UTF-8 is the one of those three that is the default for almost all systems right now. The 8 stands for what is the smallest number of bits that can be used to represent a character. So a UTF-8 UTF character can be represented in 8 bits for some of the characters, and then we can represent um, re characters that are... Um, some characters require more than eight bits in order to represent them. 
If you ever run into a problem with an encoding, you'll see it in some sort of a um, visualizer, like this text editor, um, and oftentimes you'll see things get messed up. So these question marks right here are not actually a bunch of question marks. It's a bunch of bits that the text editor wasn't able to interpret using the character encoding that you gave it. So here you can see that the character encoding that the text editor is trying to use to interpret the bits is called ANSI, ANSI. And it turns out that it found a bunch of bits that don't have a translation in ANSI's code table. And so the text editor didn't know what to do, so it just filled in those characters with question marks. We can take that same file, and if we interpret it in UTF-8, we'll actually understand what those characters are meant to represent. And there are a bunch of um, Cyrillic characters from the Russian language. So if you encounter strange representations of your characters like that, you might be looking at your text document in something that doesn't understand the character set you're working with. Here's an example of the same thing in a PDF document. You can see that there are a bunch of examples of things that are probably math symbols that have been replaced by a box with an X through it. The box with an X through it is like the question mark from the previous slide. That document doesn't really want a bunch of boxes with X's through it. It's just that the program that's showing me the PDF used a translation table that doesn't know how to translate those particular characters, and instead it just replaces it with, its, with a box with an X through it because it doesn't know what to do. If you were to open this PDF with a different character encoding, um, the PDF program would probably be able to show it to you correctly. So in summary, key points. Files are bits that are stored on secondary storage devices. Bits are translated into text using character encodings. If you have incorrect tables, you're going to get funky characters. XML is stored as a text file. And anytime you work with data, you're going to be looking at it through some program that shows you those zeros and ones through a lot of different abstractions, whether it's a text editor, an image editor, or a sound uh, media player. Different systems need to specify what, what encoding you're using whenever you exchange data or if you load up a file that isn't in an expected format. Whenever in doubt, just use UTF-8, though. It's an easy rule to follow. That forms the foundation of our understanding of how our XML files are going to be stored. I hope that's helpful going forward in being able to work with XML files. Thank you for your attention.